It is so good to be in a place where God says, I like to come to. A day in his courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. Dennis and I get to go to a lot of churches and Clarence, who often travels with us, does the same thing. And, and um, we, we examine the worship. <laughs> and sometimes we enter in and sometimes we try to find out if there is a place to enter in. And, and we have this, this little expression that we'll have that some places you can go and you can say, man, there ain't nothing like good worship. But for some places we say, that wasn't nothing like good worship. <laughs> but this is good worship here. This is, this is real good worship. And if you don't get to visit other places where they worship or try to, then you don't know how good you have it. And, and of course... Everybody can't sing the song, There is Power in the Name of Jesus, like Dennis can. When Dennis says power, you are convinced that there is power. Everybody doesn't have pipes like that. So once in a while, you have to do like a friend of mine. He was, a, I think he still is. He's, he's almost 400 pounds, and so he can't dance like he used to. But he had a little skinny elder. And whenever the song would be so good he would want to dance, he'd just sit, look at him and says, Peter, go dance for me. <laughs> so he need a surrogate dancer. Some of us need a surrogate power in the name of Jesus. Come on, everybody say power as loud as you can. Power. See, but if you don't have about 300, 400, 500 people, then just say, Dennis, say power for us. And, um, and you can have people like that in your house. I'm so glad to be here with you, Apostle. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've been trying to figure out why I hadn't been invited for a long time, but <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just messing with you. Your, your dad was such a dear, dear friend and uh, an encourager, a spiritual warrior, and, and his daughter is like unto him. And... Uh, Celebrate good leadership. My wife sends her greetings and uh, probably would have come if I had encouraged her to come. But we've been on the road a lot and we're going to be back on the road again. So I'll bring her the next time. A few years from now when we get invited. <laughs> We love your pastor. She is such an amazing woman of God. And um, <laughs> accompanying me is uh, my associate, my friend, my coworker. Um, we can't call people who travel with us partners anymore. Um, <laughs> we, I was in a church, and uh, the guy said, in fact, it was California, so you can understand the response. Um, the, uh, the moderator of the conference, he says, we're going to receive our offering, and in just a moment, Bishop Garlington is going to come with his partner. And, uh, and somebody got a little bit upset because they didn't know it was that kind of church, and I said, and they said, this ain't that kind of church, and so that's, that's not his wife. So I love Dennis. He's an amazing man of God seminary graduate, pastored. He has all kinds of amazing experience, but he loves God and he's talented. And I'm excited to be here. We brought some resources. One is a book that I wrote years ago, but it's still a bestseller. And I call it the best book I've ever read on worship that I wrote. Um, so that's here. Another CD, it's included. But what we've been doing, what my administrator and our our resource department, what he has done, he says, let me just, instead of taking cassettes and CDs, remember cassettes? How about eight tracks? <laughs> Some of you go way back, right? But anyway, he said, I can put 
I can put 20 of your messages on one of these cars. And so he said, I'll create something that he called master class. And on the master class are messages within certain um, spheres of subject matter. Uh, this one is called will, the will of God. And people are always asking, well, what's the will of God for my life? And, um, and I tell them it's in the Bible. Or on these, because <laughs> these little cards here. And then there's a message uh, series, master class, we call it Words. And this one is on wealth. I'm really interested in wealth. And I have found that the best way to get wealth is to give wealth. And worship. Worship is who we are. We are worshipers. And of course, if you live in America today, you understand whether you like it or not, you're in warfare. And all of these resources are available. Where's my, my guy who's been helping us? Here, you can do this. Do you have a copy of this book? Yes. You do? And the CDs? Not the CDs, so give her the CDs. And then ask her which one of these she wants and then just give it to whoever else is available. We sew. Everybody say, we sew. We sew. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. I hope you're interested. And I'm grateful that this morning, uh, our youngest daughter, uh, who has been in my life, well, I won't tell you how long she's been in my life, but She's here with me t today, and uh, and my and her, her son, my grandson, who's aptly named Joseph. And so, who are you guys anywhere? Just she said, look to your life. Oh, there they are. You couldn't get any further back. They, they were all out of seats. Yeah. So there are two right up here. Right, right up here, two seats right up here. Well, can, the, can the urshers, <laughs> can the urshers bring them down? I just wanna, I wanna see her face. Her name is Shauna, and his name is Jeff. Bless you, girl. So good, because y'all live a long way from here, so. Come on, somebody say Holy Spirit. A number of years ago, I was ministering. Actually, I had visited a place where Holy Spirit had been moving. It was a revival atmosphere, and, um, and I was so glad to be there. But not at first, because... What I saw in that setting, and this, was, this would have been in Canada, and I was in a room with about 2,000 people, and, uh, and, and I was looking at this revival that they said was taking place there. But all I could see were people doing what I used to see in the church when I was a teenager growing up. But when we were doing it, it was emotionalism but in Canada it was called revival and I said I said how is it that when black folks do it it's emotionalism but when white folks do it it's revival and I guess maybe because black folks do it all the time so you can get white folks to do it it's got to be revival <laughs> and uh, I was a little bit attitudinal about it and so um, I didn't like the music didn't like the songs they were they were country western kind of songs, you know. Um, and I just said, oh man, I can't stand this. But, but then God touched me, I mean, in that place. God can touch you even if you don't want to be touched. And, and I should have remembered that when I was a lot younger, when God touched me and I hit the floor and, and I was rolling back and forth. I'm just a teenager and I had tried to duck it and 
I'm rolling back and forth. And all the while I'm lowering back and forth, I'm saying, no, no, no. And God was saying, yes, yes, yes. And I had stuff in my pockets because our services were real long. And so we, we would get our nourishment. I had a bunch of peanuts and some other things. And every time I would roll, I would lose some. And it would just be all over the place. I could say, oh, he was over there. I can tell he was over there. And in that moment, when I was touched in Canada, God did something in me. And uh, what he did in me was, I still don't. No, I can't define it. Can't, I can describe it that it was, it was wrecking. And, and I hit the floor, and I just started to cry, just sob, just gently sob, you know, kind of a, a, a managed, controlled, emotional experience. And, and, um, and this lady was prophesying. She was just speaking over me. She just prayed for me, and I'm on the floor. And um, I said, I heard her say, Oh, Father, just heal this man of all of his rejection. Now, when she prayed that prayer, I'm a bishop. I lead a network. I'm a songwriter. I write books. I travel all over the world. And respected in certain areas. And so I kept saying, in my heart, because you can't talk to people when you're crying. And, um, and so I said, I ain't got no rejection. That's what I was saying. And I said, shut up. And so she kept saying it. And, uh, and I kept saying, I don't have any rejection. I'm, I'm, I'm Joseph Carlington. I, and I, I, I began to celebrate who I was. And then I saw in my spirit like a wide door, but it was moving. In the th and the way it was moving was like this. It was this way when I first saw it, and then it was doing like this. And I heard the Lord say, you can take my perspective or yours. He said, if you take your perspective, you can leave here just like you came. He said, but if you take my perspective, I'll change you. Not thinking that I need a change, but if God says something, he's right every time he says it. And so I had this sense that this door was closing and I needed to do something about it. And I didn't want it to close. And I tell people sometimes, God will give you a choice, but it won't be much. You say, I want the will of God, and God says, here, take this. And you say, well, what else is there? He said, this is it. This is it. And so I said, okay, God, I'll take your perspective. And when I said that, it was like that passage in Genesis 7 when he, the scripture says, when the fountains of the deep were broken open, then the heaven was open. A lot of us want God to do something in our lives, but we're still locked up. And the unlocking has to do with your will to say to God, do what you want to do. And I, I prayed that prayer. And I'm telling you, I thought I was just having a moment and it, I, was, I was just crying. But I went from, I mean, in warp speed, I went from just gently weeping before Jesus to ugly crying. And, um, and I had all these people standing around me, most of them white. I think I was the only black person in that audience. And... Um, and I could just imagine what they were saying because I'm frustrated and I'm embarrassed, but I, I just told God, go ahead and do it. And, uh, and I'm crying, and I, and I see all these people standing, looking at me, lying in the middle of that circle, and thinking, poor black man, he's experienced. <laughs> he's experienced. I said, I ain't black, and I ain't got no rejection, but I... Ah! And, I'm, and, and I'm slobbering on my, on my nice coat. I don't know how long I was there, but when, when I came to, there was nobody there but the janitor. And he was running the vacuum cleaner close to me, <laughs> kind of like to annoy me to get me out of the way. And so I'm, I'm, and, and I looked at him, and he, it's like he was saying, hey, look, it's just the two of us here. If you get out, I can go. So I got out. I went to the hotel where I was staying, and I sat on the side of my bed, and I asked the Lord this question. What in the fatal fire 
happen to me over there? And he didn't answer me. He didn't answer me. So I got back to the morning service, and somehow the worship had changed radically from that night to that morning. And they were singing songs that I thought, where did he get that song? One was, was uh, Sweet Wind. There's a fire burning all across the land. And then he was singing another song called Mercy is Falling, is Falling, is Falling. Some of you haven't heard these songs, but they, they are revival atmosphere songs that when sung, it was like the Holy Spirit says, oh, I like that song. And that song was really interesting because they would sing, Mercy is falling, is falling, is falling. Mercy is falling like the sweet spring rain. Mercy is falling, is falling all over me. And that was first. And then they had this little bridge. Hey ho, I receive your mercy. Hey ho, I receive. So I, I took that song back to our church. When songs born in a revival atmosphere are sung outside of that atmosphere, they have a completely different meaning. And we were singing that song, and I said, guys, I want you to learn this. And they said, uh, Pastor, we, we can learn this song, but we're going to have to change that hey-ho part. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Revival's funny. Revival, when it's out there and you're reading about it in history and you weren't there when the person writing about it opens it up to you, you can assume anything about it. But revival in the midst of revival, that's a whole different thing. It, it, it's a reflection of people who have said to God, I yield to you. So when Dennis says, there is power in the name of Jesus, power doesn't mean like plug in your little clock or whatever thing that you have. It doesn't mean that kind of power. This is Holy Ghost power. This is the power that emanates from the person who when God said, let there be light. That person said, I'll take care of it. The Holy Spirit is the executive agent of the Trinity. So when God says, let there be something, he, he, he carries out the orders. God speaks, God imagines, Son speaks, Holy Spirit says, I've got this. And most of us don't realize what goes on in your life that has any degree of success to it has a whole lot to do with the fact that you have within you a person who is always there, always with you, no matter where you are. Always there. When Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, he's not talking about who he is in his humanity. In Jesus' humanity, there were certain things that he could not do because he chose to do it. He is God and man, human and divine. He's deity. And yet, as the son of God, as a man, as a human being, whenever he wanted to accomplish something, he did what we have to do. He relied upon the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. Would you look with me, please, at John 20? I'm not going to be with you long as... Britney Spears said to her first husband. <laughs> I think that was so funny. That's, that's. I'm at John 20. Would you just join me? I don't want to go anywhere crazy. Verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. Say that to somebody, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw him, they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Peace be with you, say that again, peace be with you. Now you have to imagine something. They are devastated. Because the person that they thought would be with them forever isn't with them forever. He's somewhere else. And they know he's dead. And the 
death that he died was so brutal and it was so final that the idea that anyone could survive that in spite of the fact that he had said to them again and again, and when I rise from the dead. But in their sorrow and in their disappointment, they don't remember any of that. And so he says these words, as the Father sent me, I also send you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. And this give me a, a brief headings. As the Father sent me, so send I you. How did the Father send Jesus? Well, he said to this wonderful, beautiful virgin teenager, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you, and that which is born in you, of you, will be called the Son of God. Jesus had a supernatural birth. Jesus had a supernatural birth, not born of the flesh of man. It, it was not something that was taking place out of the sexual relationship that a man has with a woman to produce a child. Jesus' birth was taken care of as a work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had a supernatural birth. If Jesus had a supernatural birth, guess what? You and I also have to have a supernatural birth. So he says to them, as the Father sent me, so send I you. I'm sending you the same way that the Father sent me. Would you say that Jesus had a supernatural birth? And then Jesus was water baptized. Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. So supernatural birth, generation, supernatural water baptism. His water baptism was not just the answer of a good conscience before God. His water baptism was an exchange in which he moved from where he was into another place. He was baptized in his baptism, he takes on our identity. In our baptism, we take, so, we take on his identity. Jesus did not get baptized because he was a sinner. He got baptized because it was necessary for him to identify with sinful people. Some people say to me, well, what if I don't get baptized? I said, I don't know about that. But the thief didn't get baptized. I said, you're right. All right, so here's your choice. Get on the cross or get in the pool. All right. So. And most of them say, all right, I'll take, the, I'll take the pool. He had a supernatural baptism. Your baptism removes you from a spiritual place of brokenness into a spiritual place. We are transferred from one kingdom to the other. He transferred me out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. So when I'm baptized in water, immersed, I go from here to there. It's a spiritual transaction. The children of Israel left Egypt by way of baptism. 1 Corinthians 10. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The only way God provided for us to get out of Egypt was through water. If you hadn't been water baptized, you can actually be filled with the Holy Spirit and still be in Egypt because you haven't made the transfer. Everybody else say, wow, just join them. Wow, wow. Well, I'm a Christian. You are. But imagine what it would have been like to be in Egypt, covered by the blood, protected by the blood, but still in Egypt after all that's done. You are going to have all kinds of adversarial issues going on in your life because the demons of Pharaoh will say, you know why you're having all these challenges. And I say it to people all the time. We ask the question, they'd say, well, I think I've got demons. I said, it could be demons or you could still be in Egypt. I said, let's get you baptized first. In baptism, I leave. Jesus had a supernatural birth. Jesus had a supernatural water baptism. Jesus was supernaturally baptized in the Holy Spirit. Standing in the waters of Jordan, the sky was torn open, as Mark says, and Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, and he heard this declaration of the Father to him, 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The last thing that Jesus heard from his father is the first thing that the enemy shared with Jesus in temptation. If you are the son of God. He said you're the son of God, but if you are the son of God. Has anybody ever said to you, well, if you were a Christian, you could do this. Look, the fact that I don't do what you think I ought to do as a Christian doesn't mean I'm not one. And if you're waiting for God to speak some wonderful things to you, get ready to hear God say some things that you don't think are all that wonderful. He was led into the wilderness. Two of the gospel writers say that. But another gospel writer says he was driven into the wilderness. Sometimes he will lead you someplace, and sometimes he will drive you someplace. Either way, you're going to get to the wilderness. And those will be those seasons in which temptations and and challenges will come that affect how you are going to walk out the rest of your life. Supernatural birth, supernatural water baptism, supernatural baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want you to look at several passages with me. Would you go with me, please, to Luke chapter 4. I reflected on what took place. This is 2023 now. So about 20 years ago, 23 years ago, a little better than 23 years ago, I had an encounter with the Lord that was transformative in every way. It changed the trajectory of my walk with the Lord. And later on, God can do things for you in which you reflect on something that took place in another season, and you realize, oh, that's when that happened. And there's a song that we sing, and it's one of the most popular songs um, on on the contemporary Christian chart, and it's, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what my heart longs for, to be Overcome by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Place your hand over your heart. Don't put it on it, but place your hand over your heart. Say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place. Fill the earth. Your glory, God, is our hearts long to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Holy Spirit, come flood this place. Your glory, glory, God is what our hearts long to be over. Your presence, your presence, your presence. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more than we'll ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. And this is my verse right here. I've tasted and seen 
of the sweetest on the lots where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord. I taste it and sing it sing it with me I taste it and the sweetest sweetest of love when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. What I didn't know, and I came to discover it after the fact. It's like most of the things that God does in your life, you don't know what he was doing until you find out that what you're now doing, you didn't do before because you had these shackles and these other things are going on in your life. I started preaching when I was 14 years old. Nobody stopped me. Somebody maybe should have. But my life went through all kinds of changes. And, and when you do things that are contrary to the person who is inside of you, you accumulate little things called shames. And they go with you. They go with you into ministry. They go with you into your success. They go with you up to a point at which you just say, God, I need you to do something for me. And, and it's at that point that you give him permission. You didn't know you gave him permission. You just said, God, I need you to do something. He said, that's all I need. And he did something for me on the floor in Toronto, Canada that I needed him to do, but it took a spiritual, Holy Spirit in charge atmosphere, much like this morning, to awaken in me a desire that I couldn't articulate and one that I rejected because I said I ain't got no rejection. That's what I said. But then on that floor, I cried and I cried. I cried all night long. I cried and I cried until I found the Lord. And that's where I was. I cried, I cried, I cried, I cried, and then I cried some more. And when I got back home, I cried some more. I'd pray for people, and I'd be crying. And then I discovered that in spite of things that I had seen in my past, I said, I wasn't seeing, when did that change? And it was in that moment on that floor I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free. See, free. Tell somebody, I want to be free. And my shame was undone. It was like Holy Spirit took all the stuff that I allowed to build up in me over a period of time. And, you know, I'd said to God, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And he says he, he will forgive you. But the forgiveness doesn't preclude the fact that the shame is gone. That's a whole different operation. And when they sang that song, those songs that were offending me the day before in the presence of Jehovah, those songs had a whole different meaning. It was like that other song we, can, we used to sing. I can see clearly now that the pain is gone. And the Holy Spirit was doing it. And he was simply saying to me, you need to let me work in you just like I worked in Jesus. Jesus did not function for one moment in his human life as God. Everything he did he relied upon the Holy Spirit to do it. He said, I can't do anything apart from that. If I cast out demons, it's this way. If I heal the sick, it's this way. If I preach, it's this way. In my prayer, it's this way. He's not doing anything as God. He's just doing something like you and I ought to be able to do it because he's God. And he did it that way. And he's saying, look, you guys think you got to be all of this and a bag of chips when all I need you to do is let me have access to any area of your life that I want. See, we say, God, take my whole life. He says, it's not your whole life I want. It's that one thing that you keep hiding from me. 
And it takes the Holy Spirit to put his finger on it. And once he does, he puts his finger on it. And sometimes you just say, God, I've had this for years. He says, I know. Why are you asking for it now? He says, my times and your times are in my hands. And I choose the time. You think because you could, you could get away with it, quote unquote, get away with it, that he can't see it. But he has his own time to do it. He has his own time to set you free. Why didn't you do it then? He said, I was working on something else. Couldn't you do it all at one time? He says, you can't handle that. The Holy Spirit is the wisest person in your life. Anytime you need an answer from God about anything, he's the person to give it to you. Have you found Luke yet? Come on, look at Luke 4. I'm using, I, I think this translation is the New American Standard. I used to use Amplified, but it was too loud. <laughs> Some people never get that. Just, but this is really a very intelligent church. Verse 14, Luke 4, 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Would you say that? In the power of the Spirit. Say it again. And news about him spread through all the surrounding district. Go to verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and was, as was his custom, he entered into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Come on, say that. The spirit is, is upon me. Now, you, you, you don't just want to read that. You want to make that declaration for yourself. And you don't have to be wild-eyed like John the Baptist. Uh, you just simply have to know that when you invited the Holy Spirit to come into your life, he came upon you. You do need to know that in order to have those kinds of encounters, you need to have something that we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Holy Spirit came upon Jesus at his water baptism. He comes upon you when you invite him to come upon you. And when he comes upon you, you can make the declaration, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recover sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That is an expression to describe jubilee. The favorable year of the Lord is jubilee. Every 50 years you had jubilee. But when Jesus comes, he comes to establish jubilee, not just for 50 years, but he establishes jubilee from now on. If you are set free, if God's done anything in your life, you're in jubilee. Somebody asked me once, I said, how does jubilee work? I said, jubilee is like playing country western music backwards. You get your house back, get your car back, get your kids back. You get it all back in Jubilee. You know it. You know that when you became saved and God moved in your life, things that were dark now get lighted up. Things that were back in here get pulled out. Things that, and we used to sing it like this in old church, things I used to do, I don't do no more. If you're still doing things you used to do, you probably haven't come into Jubilee yet. Jubilee is the outcome of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon our lives. Would you go with me, please, to Corinthians? I'm sorry, not Corinthians, but to Romans. When you're at Romans 14, let me know. If you're there, say amen. amen. Verse 16. 
Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. Read verse 17 with me. Just read it right out now. Come on. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Say it again. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. A lot of people in my church, uh, we've been using a, a translation called the Passion Translation. And um, it'd be good for you to have one if you don't. And if you don't have one, I'll buy one for you. Here's how it reads in the Passion Translation. The kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about food and drink, but is in the realm of the spirit. The kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about food and drink, but is in the realm of the spirit. Let's say it like this. The kingdom of God is in the realm of the spirit. Would you say, please, the kingdom of God is in the realm of the spirit. The kingdom of God, the rule of God, the realm of God's rule has been entrusted to this a remarkable person called the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is in charge, absolutely in charge of the kingdom of God. If you haven't been approved by him to be in the kingdom of God, you're not in the kingdom, no matter how you sing about it. When Jesus is having this conversation with Nick at night, this is... <laughs> This is John chapter 3. Nicodemus, you remember, he comes to Jesus by night, and he's having this conversation with him. And, <laughs> and Jesus says to him, because, because Nick has some questions. He could see something going on, but he can't explain it. And so he says to Jesus, he says, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no man could do these miracles that you do. And then Jesus, knowing that Nicodemus has a question that he can't articulate, he puts it in words for him. And he says, Nicodemus, unless one is born from above. Most translations say, again. But the Greek word is a word that's more often translated above. In other words, Nicodemus, you have to have an, a, a birth that, has its, that had its origin in heaven. He says, unless you have been born from above, you can't even see the kingdom. You can't perceive it. He says, and unless you are born of water and spirit, you can't enter the kingdom. So my, my problem is that a lot of us have, have a birth that enables us to see, but we haven't had what what Peter calls in Acts 2.38, the Peter package, repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of Christians, and they love, they love Jesus. They have the heart of Jesus, but they don't have the empowerment that he promised you to have that he said you're going to need it in order to do this. So the realm of the kingdom, the realm of the kingdom is under the auspices and the management of the Holy Spirit. He's the executive person of the Trinity. An executive is somebody who carries out the orders and the disposition. He carries it out. So, like I said, when God says, let there be light, Holy Spirit says, I've got this. He's involved in the creation. He's involved in the formation of stars and planets and systems. He's involved in the gathering of the pieces that are associated with your prophetic word. When God gives you a word from the Holy Spirit, it's going to take the Holy Spirit to make that word come about. You guys are too quiet over here. I'm coming over here. <laughs> Think of it like this. When he prophesies to us, he is saying to us, this is going to take place in your life. Now, Isaiah 34, 16 says, God speaks a word and his spirit gathers. He speaks and his spirit gathers. God speaks, say it please. And his spirit gathers. One translation says his spirit assembles. His spirit assembles. Years ago when our children were real small, I had this Christmas surprise for them. 
And I waited until they were all asleep, and I pulled this great big box out, and I opened it, and there were all of these pieces scattered around in this box. And I said, what? And I closed the lid, and I looked at it again, and I was asking, what did I miss when I bought this? And there was this statement on the box that says, some assembly required. <laughs> so you got this word that God's going to take you someplace. And you say, yes, and you think it's going to happen next week or next month, at least next month. Year, okay, a lot of people waited a year, but not 12, not 14. What's going on here? God spoke. And the Holy Spirit has to assemble all the pieces that will cause that prophecy to have an impact in your life. And if some of the pieces aren't born yet, you got to wait for it. It doesn't mean he's missed it. It means he's given you something to launch your spiritual life and your prayer life and the anticipation of what God has to do with you. What's the Holy Spirit doing? He's saying to somebody in South Africa, I need you to get ready because I'm going to send you a guy by the name of Garlington. And he's saying to somebody in London or in Australia or whatever. And, and there are things that I feel like God wants you to understand. I've got this. I have this in hand. You are concerned about it, but you don't know. I've already taken care of it. <laughs> somebody say, he's got this. Say it again. He's got this. He said to the king of Ahaz in chapter 6, of, and seven of Isaiah, he says, the thing that you are worried about isn't even going to happen because I've got this. Tell somebody God's got this. Say it again. God's got this. There are moments in my life when God has said something and it just doesn't fit in with what I'm thinking. And, and uh, there is it's, it's like God says something. You ever, you, ever, you ever be in a room where somebody is singing and a whole lot of folks are singing, and then there's one person singing off key. And anybody can hear it. It's, it's a discordant thing. And it, it's just, God, what is happening here? And I remembered this movie where Superman had flown up to this real high point in, the, in this office building. And Lois Lane, for some reason, had been kicked out of the office building, and she's hanging on to the ledge Way, way, way up. Superman comes and he flies up to her. And he says, don't worry, Miss Lane, I've got you. And she says, what I want to know is, who's got you? <laughs> See, does God have you? Does God have your circumstances? And even if you can't see him, he's working. Even if you can't feel him, he's working. Darlene Bishop went to visit her son, who was an associate in her church, and she was looking for him. She got to the door, and her granddaughter answered. She's about seven. And she said, where's your daddy? She says, I don't know, Grandma. My daddy working. And she said, uh, well, when is he coming back? I don't know, Grandma. My daddy working. Well, how long has he been gone? I don't know, Grandma. My daddy working. No matter what she asked him, that was her response. I don't know my daddy's working. She knew two things. I don't know. And the other thing was, my daddy's working. She said God spoke to her. She said, tell him I'll come back. Spoke to her. He said, God said to her, Darlene, did you notice that she doesn't know where he is? Doesn't know what he's doing? Doesn't know how long he's going to be gone? Doesn't know when he's coming back? She said, he doesn't know any of that. All she knows is that he's working. If you don't get anything else from today, it ought to be even when I can't see what he's doing, even when I can't see how he's assembling the pieces, even when I don't know how he's going to make it, I'm serving a God who can not only say something to me about what he's going to do, if it's dead, he can raise it. If it's broken, he can fix it. If it's sick, he can heal it. And if it doesn't exist, he can create it. That's the Holy Spirit I'm talking about. And he's not someone who's outside of you. He's someone who's inside of you. 
He is the someone who, who, when Jesus says, I'm going to leave you, but I'm coming back. In fact, the person who is going to be with you has already been with you. Do you remember that, that picture we have of John and the disciples? They're all in the upper room. It's a classic picture. And where is John's head? He's, he's resting on. Joseph, could you give me for a second? I wouldn't do this with everybody, but since you owe me your existence. <laughs> he's a good looking guy. Uh, come, so we're going to sit over here. Over on this side, in the, in the picture, he's on the left side. So, where is. Where is John's head? Right over here. So he is so close to Jesus that whenever they want to know something from Jesus, they ask John. John, what did he mean? And, and he looks up and says, what did he mean? And I tell them and he tells them. <laughs> now, what if somebody said to John, hey, John, why not let some of us get, us get close? What's John going to say? <laughs> no, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Now, here's what Jesus is saying. It's necessary for me to leave because if I leave, I can come back to you in another form. The form that I'm in right now, only one can have this. But when I go, all y'all, can have the same kind of intimacy. You can have the same kind of closeness that he has right now. And it, and it can happen anywhere in the world. I don't have to be at the same table with you in the same geographical, physical arena. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be in you. I'm going to be abiding in you. My Father, myself, and the Holy Spirit, we, we will all come and we will take up residence in you. You got God inside. Say it, I've got God inside. How do you work that out? Thank you, Joseph. He's single too. Which is not a bad thing. The thing that the, the church struggles with is that we think he comes and he goes. We think he's here and he's not. How is church? What's good? Was God there? Well, yes. How do you know? Well, I took him. He was in me, so I know he was there. Now, whether or not he was with everybody, like, because there's sometimes when you're in it and there's just somebody who's, you, you know what happens when people sit down on your preaching and you're just saying, go ahead, just make me feel like I have the Holy Ghost. That doesn't happen that way. He comes, say he comes, to abide with us for how long? It says forever, doesn't it? How long is forever? Yeah, it is. But you cannot define this. And so here's Holy Spirit. Somebody say Holy Spirit. Say it again, Holy Spirit. He says, if any man or woman have the Spirit of God, he dwells in you. If the same Spirit that dwells in you raised Christ from the dead... He will even raise you. You cannot be called a child of God, a son of God, if you don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And you're not here to take up space. You're here to get informed, to be taught, like the young lady was sharing with us. I thought she was going to read the whole Bible personally, but it, <laughs> it was amazing that she knew those verses and that they applied. A lot of people have no idea what the Bible says. And many of us are struggling because we don't know the scriptures. And so I'm dealing with people all the time. I've never had a prophecy. I said, well, do you have a Bible? And they say, yes. I said, there are, there are thousands of prophecies in them. Open your Bible. I did it one day. I, op I said, God, I need a word from you, and I don't have a prophet. I'm going to open this Bible, and wherever I open it, you're going to be talking to me. And I opened it in an amplified Bible, and I was complaining with God, and I felt real good about it. And I've learned this. I've learned this. When you can't tell God how you really feel, 
Find somebody in the Bible who did. And then say to God what they said. And that's what I did. Jeremiah said, I, I did not assemble with all the people who were doing this and that. And, that. and he's just saying, he says, and, and your words are to, to me like a deceitful brook. Why is it like this? And then when he got finished complaining with God, God said, Jeremiah, if you will give up these mistaken tones, this mistaken tone of distrust and unworthy suspicions concerning my faithfulness, then I will do this. It was like he was complaining to God and God was complaining to him. When you talk to God, he can let you say anything you want. He, you can't embarrass him. You can't offend him, of course, unless you say the wrong thing, which you wouldn't say anyway. But when, when you finish talking to him, he says, now is it my turn? Because when he speaks, there's something else. The psalmist says it like this. You are just whenever you say anything. Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit. Say it again. Say Holy Spirit. Put your hand right here again. Say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill my atmosphere. How is it that God can let you walk with him and he walk with you? You pray for people and they get healed. You look at the scriptures and they speak to you. You go and preach to a congregation and they say that was the best word I've ever heard. And you don't know that two days from then, two years from then, 20 years from then, God's going to say something to you he could have said 20 years ago. But he's got a long way to deal with us. Say Holy Spirit again. Say it again. One of my mentors said, God doesn't judge you for where you are. He judges you for what you refuse to become. When when Abraham knew nothing about God, God chose him. When he brought him to the land, he promised that he would be with him. When he went down into Egypt with his wife, and he said, honey, don't tell him that you're my wife. Just tell him that you're my my sister, you know, because... They'll look at you and see how pretty you are, and they'll kill me. So, he, would you do this for me? She said, yes, honey. And it didn't go well, at least for Pharaoh. Abraham, the father of all those who have faith, lied like railroad ties. <laughs> he lied. The father of the faithful lied, and not just once. Because his wife said, Well, when we left home, this is what he extracted, a promise he extracted from me. We wouldn't let him teach the family life class in our Bible studies. You did what? And when he lied to Abimelech, God said to Abimelech, you had that man of God and get him out or I'm going to kill you. He says it to him in a dream. And God, he says, hey, what's up? He said, he told me. He said, I know he told you. I know he told you. That's why you're not dead. (laughs) Now give the wife back. And then this is what he said that I've always thought about. And just said, you said that. Here's what he said. He lied to you, right? Yeah. Now go let him pray for you. (laughs) God's funny. Holy Spirit's funny. Just say, okay, is that the one who lied? Yes. All right. Ask him to pray for you. And just say. Holy Spirit, what in the world? He says, but you're the prophet. And in spite of your failings, there's still authority that you have in me because I'm working in your life. And I can see then two chapters from Genesis 20. I'm going to ask you to give me your son. And you're not going to say no. God sees something out there that you can't see out there. So that when you're looking at your worst moments, your failures, and you're saying, God, I just wish I had never done that. He said, I wish you'd never done that too. But that's not the end of the world. You're lying right now. Yes, I did. You told him that. She was your sister. Well, kind of truth, you know. She kind of, well, you know, that, that wasn't a complete lie. But you misrepresented something. Well, I know, I know. I said, 
I took the first, but I didn't really steal it. That wasn't in my heart to do. I just took it, but I don't call that stealing. He says, I call that stealing. God calls it lying. God looks at us and he says, it's my spirit in you. Integrity is here in you. And sometimes I found that, just like with Abimelech, Abimelech said to God, in the integrity of my heart, I've done this. Had you discovered that sometimes people who, not, who are not saved can have more integrity than people who are saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost with fire, walking, running, casting out demons, and lying. A lion is, a, is an abomination before God, but a very present help in trouble. Just don't do it at the wrong time. Say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. You guys are in a time of fasting. We are in our church as well. What's the point in fasting if you're not going to allow God to say something to you through the Holy Spirit? Did you get the words, to the, the, the lyrics of the song that I wanted to, to share with you, Holy Spirit? You got it? Is it on the screen? Can we put it on the screen? So I can see it. To be convinced. There it is. The kingdom is in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom. Think of the Holy Spirit as a sphere for believers. That kingdom is in the realm of the Holy Spirit. The authority. The, the, it's everything that's congruent with Holy Spirit is in the kingdom. You can't get in the kingdom apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't understand it apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. This, this entire Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never say anything to you that's contrary to something he already said. The Pharisees said to Jesus and to those around him, he's casting out demons by Beelzebub. But here's how Jesus responded. He said, if I cast out demons, I do it by the Holy Ghost or I do it by the finger of God. He says, and if I do that, then the kingdom has come upon you. When you set people free, the kingdom is expressing its influence. When the children of Israel were in Egypt and Moses and Aaron came in and they began to do those signs and wonders that are part of that whole deliverance package. They could, the magicians could make blood like they did. They could create frogs like they did. They could do several of the other things. But then one day, Moses made gnats. And the magicians went out and they tried to make gnats. And they came back and they said, we can't make gnats. We didn't study that in magic number one. So we think this must be the finger of God. Jesus says, I cast out demons by the finger of God. If you cast them out, guess how you're going to cast them out? By the finger of God. We can't repeat what he did. It's called the finger of God. I tell people, don't let God give you the finger. It's like you need to be aware that the Holy Spirit is no punk. He's God. He's not an it. He's God. He's God, the Holy Spirit. He comes and he abides in you. The same Holy Spirit that created by fiat, with God, the universe, that same Holy Spirit is inside of you. And John says it like this in 1 John 4. Greater is he that's in you than 
he who is in the world. Greater is he. Solomon said, how can we build the temple big enough for you, God, to sit on? Heaven is your throne. Earth is your footstool. Who can build it? And God says, son, you don't realize I already built it back in the Garden of Eden. I built a temple big enough. If you could just imagine the bigness of God, the largeness of God living inside of you, you then would begin to have a, a small understanding of, of how big you are on the inside. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. And then Paul says in Colossians, and in you, in you dwell the fullness. You too are filled with the fullness of Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Read John 14 and you'll see he is saying, my Father and I, we will come and we'll make up our abode with you. We will live inside you. So when, when Ananias and Sapphira lie, Peter says, you lied to the Holy Spirit who is in you. He says, and so now, you're going to go to a better place. Remember I said he is the executive agent of the Trinity. He not only is the executive agent, he's the executor. Would you say, I love you, Holy Spirit? Say it again. Come on. Would you stand with me, please? I don't believe I've said anything radical or new that this church has never heard before because your apostle has been with us and I've, I've listened to Harry Jackson say things and I said, I read the same Bible he reads. Why did you show him that and not me? You don't realize how fortunate you are to have the history in God that you have through teaching and ministry, through presence, through prophecy, through, through brokenness through the presence of God. Presence, we're presence people. And when we can't experience the presence, we just simply say, what's the point? And so we're looking for something. We're hungry for God. We want all that he has for us. But we are trying to find it in the wrong place. And the young woman who hears from God, amazing psalmist, she sat down and she said, I heard her say in our church once, she said, I want to be so close to his face, I can tell what kind of shaving lotion he uses. I got tickled to that because all the pictures I have of Jesus, he's got a beard. <laughs> but I knew what she was saying. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Comforter, teacher, paraclete, mediator, advocate, reminder. Some call you Holy Spirit. Some say Holy Ghost. But I love to call you friend that's how I go sing with me Holy Spirit Holy Spirit Holy Ghost Comforter Teacher Paraclete Paraclete Mediator Advocate Reminder Some call you Holy Spirit some say Holy Ghost, but I love to call 
you friend. Sing it again. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Lift your voice. Holy Ghost. Comforter. Teacher. Paraclete. Mediator. Advocate. Reminder. Psalms. You Holy Spirit. Some say Holy Ghost, but I love to call you friend. Holy Dove, Holy Dove, Spirit of love, Spirit of truth, leader, Holy One, Mighty One, Counselor. Revealer, some call you Holy Spirit, some say Holy Ghost, but I love to call you friend. Some call you, some call you Holy Spirit, some say Holy Ghost, but I love. To call, but I love to call, but I love to call you friend, but I love but I love, but I love. But I love to call you friend. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes. Take this with you. It was the evening of his resurrection, the first Sunday after his resurrection. It's when he said, I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to give you resurrection life. I have generation. You're going to have regeneration. So the spirit of life, the new birth, is the spirit of the resurrected son of God. And he said, he breathed on them. And when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, if he is breathing on them, and saying, receive the Holy Spirit, they are inhaling what he's breathing on them. I'm going to say, receive the Holy Spirit. Not like he said, but I'm just going to say, because here's the problem. You can receive the Holy Spirit as much as you want. You can be filled again and again and again. I mean, baptized once, filled a lot of times. So I'm just going to, I'm going to say, receive the Holy Spirit. And you just take a deep breath. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Take a deep breath. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. The most significant Sunday was the Resurrection Sunday. The next most significant Sunday was when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's when the power came. From that point on in the book, from Acts 2 on, every time they talked about receiving the Holy Spirit, it was with the baptism. That baptism was always in the scriptures associated with speaking in tongues. When the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit, the Jewish people knew they had because they spoke in tongues. They said they received it just like we did. Don't let anybody take that from you. If you don't have a prayer language, just get one. Open your mouth wide and he will fill it. If you don't have a prayer language, you need a prayer language. Because there's certain things that you just can't say to God because we're not that smart. We don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that are too deep for words. 
You say, I don't know how to speak in tongues. Well, then just groan. Groanings are deeper than words. And then go from groanings to sounds and little words in which you declare, God, I thank you. I thank you. My grandson, standing right there, he's five years old. He's sitting in the living room and he's watching television. But we are in the kitchen praying for a young woman who desperately needed a touch on her life. And we're praying in tongues. He was just praying in tongues because we didn't know all that she needed. He got up out of the chair, walked into the kitchen, put his hand on that lady, and I heard him at five speak in tongues. At five. I don't know if he remembers that or not. But here's what I want to say to you. There is no baby version of the Holy Ghost. Kids get the same person that you get. They, they get the same gift. They get the same power that you get. If you've not received the baptism, if you've not had your insides filled to overflowing and your outsides crying because you don't have any other choice, I feel that the first sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is tears. You're praying for someone and they've never... And all of a sudden, they start to cry. And I say, you are so close, because I see this all the time. If you don't have a prayer language, it's because you just haven't chosen to use it. And so just close your eyes, wherever you are. And all of us who have a prayer language, just begin to pray gently, articulate your sounds. I heard, I heard Apostle do it as we were sitting in the green room. Just kuboshe tena mani siara, se akala barara, resha baba karite, se ne akala baraba, se ando rebebe se akala rara, se menelela, shike andia kolo bobo sarata, se be na karare de dadabara. In South Africa, I told a young lady, I said, I said, do you have a prayer language? She says, no, I don't. I said, well, I have one, and I'm going to use mine. I want you to listen to me praying in tongues. And then I want you just to say as many of the words that you hear me say. She said, well, I don't want to make anything up. And I said, I'm not making anything up either. I said, they're real words. Well, I don't know. I said, do you have children? She said, yes. I said, when before they spoke, did you ever lean over the crib and say, Mama, Mama, Mama? Or did you say, I don't want you to make anything up, honey, so when you're ready to talk? She said, no, I said that. I said, then say what I'm saying. And I began to talk in tongues. And she heard what I said. And the next thing I know, she's gone some other place with her language but you can say what you hear. Come on, do it again. If you, if you don't have a prayer language, just listen. Somebody standing next to you, just listen and allow Holy Spirit to give you the same kinds of words. Use your language. Come on, use your language. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you're already baptized in the Holy Spirit, just say to him, I want more. I want more. Say it, I want more. I want more. The prophetic word that we heard 
as we came to the close of our worship service was that God wanted to deal with issues that we were facing, feelings, senses of abandonment. God doesn't hear me. And if you're at that place, if you're one of those persons, and you're in a place where you're wanting to say, God, I'm thirsty, and all I want is more of you, it's these kinds of seasons in pursuing God that produce that kind of hunger. A tree can be cut down, Job said, and withered at the stump, but at the scent of water, just the smell of water, it can start producing leaves and branches. I smell water. If you can smell it, you can get to it. And if you have a hunger for more, just want you just to come and stand right here. And you can actually stand wherever you are, but if you want more, just come on. Just come on up. Thank you, Lord. I want more. Just right, standing right here. Let, let your prayer be, I want more. Just say it in your heart. Say it. Articulate. All I want is. Thank you, Jesus. All I want is more of you. All I want is more of you. Longing for, but more of you, more of you. All I want is more of you. All I want is more of you. Is more, Jesus Lord, but more of you, more of you, more of you. Say, Jesus, I am thirsty. Jesus, I am thirsty. Won't you come and fill me? Won't you come and fill me? Earthly things. Earthly things have left me dry. Only you can satisfy. All I want is more. All I want. All I want is more. One more time. All I want is more of you. And just extend your hands to him. See here in this place, in this hour of need that our nation and the world has never faced before, I stand in an atmosphere of an open heaven. And I say to you, I don't have enough for the season ahead of me. I want more. Now, Holy Spirit, I just speak to your people, to your house, to the desperation that all of us are facing in different ways. Our, our needs are as different as our faces. But I ask you now to come now, in this moment, in this house, in this time, in this season, and change us radically. Do more for us than we've ever seen. Do more for us than we've ever thought you could do you see the places inside of us that are saying we're thirsty and we didn't even know it. 
We're hungry and we didn't know it. But would you satisfy that hunger? Just stretch your hands up to him and just say, God, here. Whatever I said, whatever, whatever has caused me to seek to walk in independence, I give that up for the sake of an outpouring of your spirit. And I don't want to move from this holy place. I want more. Speak it out. I want more. Say it again. Use your outside voice. You know, like he can't hear you. Because the scripture says, when they lifted their voice, when they lifted their voice, when they lifted their voice, I want more. More God. More God. More. 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 power in the name of Jesus. Say it. There is power in the name of Jesus. To do what? Where's Dennis? I want you to hear this. A man heard a commotion in his city, but he was blind. And he said to someone, what's going on? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he said, the Jesus who's been healing people and opening blinded eyes? And he said, that's the one. And the Bible says he began to scream. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy. And the guy rebuked him. He said, it's not that kind of church service. And I'm just paraphrasing now, but what he said to this guy was, can you fix these? And he says, no, I can't. He said, he can. I'm not trying to get your attention. I'm trying to get his. So get the attention because when he called out the more, Jesus stopped where he was headed and turned and said, what do you want? What would you say to Jesus if he said to you, what do you want? Get his attention first. Lift your voice because we said there is power in the name of Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus. To break every chain. Now, I'm going to say it to you. You can respond out loud or in your heart. But Jesus asked the man who was blind, and he could see he was blind, but he needed him to articulate his need. And Jesus says, what do you want? I'm going to ask you, when you finish saying Jesus, and he says, what do you want? What are you going to say? Whatever it is, your need and what I say might be different. I'm I need some new glasses, but I need some things more than that. I want you to lift it on three, on three times. Just shout as loud as you can, Jesus, and just get still for a moment so you can hear what he says. On three. Jesus. One, two, three. Come on. Jesus! Come on. Again. Jesus! Again. Just listen to what he says.
Now just say thank you. Thank you. I had a friend once who said, if you ever need anything, just call me. And I told someone, if I called him and said, I need $10,000 in my bank account in the next three days, he would say, give me the details. And I'll send it to you. But I wouldn't close out that conversation by saying, when I hear that it's in the bank, I'll thank you. <laughs> you say thank you at the promise. If he says something to you in response to your quest, even if you don't see it, you got it. Say thank you. How, how easy is that? How easy is that? Because what he's saying to you, you've got it because I got it. Just want to thank you forever and ever and ever for all that you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Get excited. Come on, just, just want to thank you forever. And ever, and ever, for all you've done for me. Oh, blessings and glory and honor. Thank you forever and ever and ever for all that you've done for me. Blessing and honor, they all, they all. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. Just want to praise you forever and ever and ever and ever for all that you've done for me. and glory and honor they all belong to you thank you Jesus for saving me thank you Jesus thank you Jesus for we're just going to say thank you Jesus come on Thank you, Jesus. 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 Lift your voice. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For blessing.
Now finish it. Finish it. Say it's done because he's working. I've got it because he's got it. Amen. Come on, give him praise. Lord, praise. Give him glory. Give him glory. Give him glory. Give him honor. How many would say that they got filled with the Spirit for the first time? Anybody? 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 Looking for a testimony? Anybody for the first time received their prayer language in this room or online? Refilled. 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 So I want to give you an opportunity to sow into Bishop's life. I know I'm calling the audible right now. We normally do what we do, right? Lord bless you, keep you, cause space shine upon you, give you peace, elevate you, cause you to be a blessing. This is normally the end. But I'm going to give you an opportunity to sow into Bishop's life. How many were blessed today? We always set an amount that we're going to give our, our guests and to bless them with and to, to sow into their life to be a blessing. But I believe that you all received today, and so I don't want to let you miss an opportunity. I believe there are people that are here that we're told to give. So I want to make that available. Is that all right? So can I ask the ushers to make available the receptacles at the door? And can I ask the tech team to put the QR code back up and put up the lower third for the people who are online? And let's pray together so that we bless the man of God today. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the seeds that are sown in this offering above the tithe, above what we've already given, God. Lord, we thank you that as we sow into Bishop Garlington, God, that this seed has a testimony far beyond these four walls. God, we thank you for the lives that will be touched even still through this man's life. In this year, God, we thank you for new territories, fresh anointing. We thank you, Lord, for increasing him even to that next dimension that you've even promised him for this season. Lord, we thank you that he freely gave. And so today we freely give to bless the man of God who delivered the word. Lord, we bless the prophet of God. We bless the man of God. And Lord, we thank you that increase comes from you, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So you can text to give by texting HCC Give to 77977. And in the Push Pay app, there is a drop-down menu that says Guest Speaker. So you can give there. If you're online, you can go to the hopeconnection.org, our website, and click Give there. Um, you can make checks payable to Hope Christian Church. That's P.O. Box 505, College Park, Maryland, 20741. If you're going to put something in the mail, but if you're in the room, you can um, write your check payable to Hope Christian Church and in the memo section, put Bishop Garlington or guest speaker. There are also offering envelopes in the seat in front of you or behind you if you're on the front row. So I'll give you a moment to prepare yourself before I bless you. And let you leave. You can also see an usher for an offering envelope. But the offering baskets, they won't be down here. So it won't march down here. It'll be as you walk out. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'll just wait another minute for those that want to give. And then I'm going to bless you. And we are going to go from this place into our week as the victorious warriors of God that we are. Hallelujah. We are in such a profound season. 
And there was just another dimension of Holy Spirit that was released in this place today. So we thank God for how he is entrusting this house with more of himself. It's truly an honor and a privilege to steward hope in this season. So if you're ready to, for me to bless you, the Lord bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May he elevate you. May he bless you and cause you to be a blessing. May he make his name famous through you. May he break every chain of resistance in your life and expand your territory in 2023. In Jesus' name, amen. Tell somebody on your way out, have an overcoming week, and the ushers will be at the door to serve you. We love you here at Hope Christian Church, and we'll see you next week.